Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 797. That is 797 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. And I hope you're doing well wherever this lovely podcast may find you. I hope you are doing swimmingly. I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? Yeah, all good. I can't lie. All good. I cannot lie. I'm enjoying life. I'm loving things. I'm being the person who I'm meant to be. And I'm striving and succeeding every step of the way. Every step of the way. Hope you are too. You guys know why you're here. You guys know why you're here. You know why you're here. We have to. We have to talk about and celebrate England beating Switzerland on penalties the other day to reach the semi-finals of the Euros. What an amazing game. What an amazing game. So far, watching England in the tournament has been a little bit hit and miss for the most part, mostly because of our tactics from the coach, mostly because of the players being a little bit scared, a little bit gun-shy to go for it. But I felt like in this particular match, once the ballers came onto the pitch, once the ballers, once the people, once the kids, once the players who are actually good with the ball at their feet and are courageous and take the balls in risky positions, receive the ball in risky positions, make riskier passes, take more chances, have shots on goal, try to create, suddenly we look like a different team. No coincidence for me. But I still have to say, we started out pretty decently. I loved the addition. I loved the addition. I loved the addition of playing Kobe Mino in midfield. Even though I'm not the biggest fan of him playing deep, I think Kobe Mino, if we're not careful, might be a player who's susceptible to like the Pogba thing, where because Pogba was a big strapping lad, very physically imposing, um, very tall, very big in that regard, people just assumed he was a DM. But I always think Pogba's career was kind of derailed because he wasn't really given a free role, apart from the time when he was at Juve, or playing in the number 10 position. That's basically his best position. And I think Mano is the same. Mano might be more of a box-to-box midfielder, but I don't think he's a DM. It didn't matter. Declan Rice did most of the DMing for him anyway, and Mano was just allowed to just ping all over the place and kind of play a midfield free role, which then freed up Jude Bellingham to be a bit further up the pitch, which then didn't leave him to kind of go wandering and trying to do the, the captain, you know, Captain America, Captain Saber Planet type of role he does sometimes. We put him in a position where he should be and it went well. But Maynard was very, very impressive. I think a lot of fans of England who don't really watch United probably got a realisation of what we see as United fans. That player is special. So special, it makes me think United don't deserve him. This current iteration of Man United, especially under the Glazer ownership, I don't know how we produce the Maynard. I don't know how a club of our standing in such disarray you know, failing all the time, finishing eighth, how have been able to produce such a player of world-class potential like Mayno? I don't know. But he was absolutely phenomenal. I also want to point out Bakayo Saka. I thought Bakayo Saka was really good to the point where I think all the good work that he did, frying his fullback, cutting in, cutting out, hugging the touchline, dribbling, going to the bar line, attempting to put in crosses... I think all of that great work he did for the majority of the first half and parts of the second half is what led to the goal. Because by the time he got the ball on the right-hand side in the second half, the defender was already scared and worried. So he immediately backed away. In the first few minutes, he was trying to come up behind Saka. But Saka is such a good winger in that it doesn't matter if you drop off, if you come in tight, he can spin you, he can run at you, he can run inside, run outside. So I think the defender wasn't sure where he was going to go. So just to kind of protect themselves, they started kind of pedaling backwards. I think it was a fullback. Um, who was it? It might have been in Rodriguez, who was kind of pe- pushing backwards, not sure what to do. And then of course, he gave um, Saka time and Saka's shot accuracy is really, really good. So Saka's shot, Saka's shot accuracy from outside the box in that position is really good. He basically does what Anthony wants to do. Anthony at United thinks he could do that sort of stuff that Saka does. But Saka's shot accuracy from that position where he cuts in 
and he could even bend the ball to the far post or the near post is incredibly good. He always gets the shots on target. Keeper saves them or they hit the post or something. So I wasn't surprised when I saw it dink on the inside and go in. And also we were lucky too. Frank the heavens. It wasn't one of those shots that kind of hits the inside of the post and then crawls along the line and goes out. We got the luck that we deserved. And I think it was crucial that goal came straight after Switzerland's goal because Switzerland's goal was very unfortunate in that I don't think Mbolo played well. The commentators were talking about Mbolo playing well, saving. I don't think he played well. I think the injury that he had, he recovered from, has affected him. He doesn't look as mobile. He's not as physically as imposing as he was in the past. And he wasn't really getting much joy out of our centre backs. I thought Stones um, and what's his name? Stones and Konsa and Walker kind of handled and locked down Mbolo pretty well. And he was their main threat, especially with Shakiri not playing. I think we did fairly well in keeping him under wraps and also Endoy. Endoy's been pretty threatening this whole entire tournament. He's got blistering pace. I thought we kept their attacking options pretty quiet, but there was a period in that first half where they started to like leng in shots a bit. And obviously the cross when it came in was very unfortunate because if I'm not mistaken, it came past two of our defenders. You know what I mean? And those are the type of crosses where you think a defender should be able to kind of knock him out, but it happened. And then we scored the equaliser pretty soon after, which then I think calmed the nerves down. But as soon as Gareth Southgate made those changes and brought on the ballers, I thought the game changed for me. Bringing on the ballers changed the entire complexity of the game. Bring on the Ivan Tonys, the Eze's, the Cole Palmers. They changed the game. Luke Shaw, I think, was a bit of a waste of time. I don't think he did much. I'm still confused why Luke Shaw is at the tournament. He's meant to be a fullback option to kind of give the, you know, our attacking players in front of him more options to run up and down the pitch. But he doesn't really overlap much. He doesn't cross much. He's very... Um, He's very attacking, shy. He's obviously coming back from an injury. Maybe he's, he's kind of cautious about not pulling his muscles again. But Luke Shaw is a wash player, absolute wash player. He came on, didn't really do much, to be fair. Didn't offer much. But the rest of the substitutes were fucking brilliant. Even Trent Alexander Arnold, I think, did pretty well for the time that he was on. But the player that I want to give a special shout out to has to be Cole Palmer. How doesn't Cole Palmer start for this, this England team? Because people were sucking off Foden. I thought Foden was okay. Foden was okay. Yes, he went into the middle. He's preferred number 10 role. But I would prefer to have Cole Palmer play there. Cole Palmer is so good on the ball. So silky. He legitimately moves with such ease, such composure. If anything, he kind of reminds me of he kind of reminds me of Messi Ozil at Arsenal. He kind of reminds me of Messi Ozil at Arsenal. That almost like languid control of the ball, the easy skipping pass of players and defenders, the ability to pass and always have the right weight on it. Like, and obviously the striking, like he's so good, Cole Palmer. So fucking good. I really want to see him play more, um, uh, you know, for England in general going forward. But most likely, because we're at the same final stage, I don't think we're going to see any big changes really to the team. The only other thing I'd say as a really aside, what's happened to Harry Kane? Harry Kane, all of a sudden, is starting to look his age. He was fairly decent before. Not decent. Probably say one of the best strikers in the world. And all of a sudden, overnight, he's starting to look his age. He runs like he's running in custard. He's not really influencing the game. He's rarely in the box when chances are coming to him. He doesn't seem to be able to run onto the ball and kind of beat the first man. He's waiting for the ball to come to him. His hold-up play isn't that great. What's happened to Harry Kane? But the option problem is Harry Kane is so good in front of goal. He's so clinical that when the ball does drop to him in the box, you want the, the opportunity to go to him. It's like Ronaldo for Portugal. Even though Ronaldo for Portugal is washed and he's old, when the ball goes in the box, you want it to land to him because you know nine times out of ten he's going to score. So in this case, if it was me and I was being really ruthless, if it was me, I would swap um, Kane for Ivan Tony. That isn't going to happen at this stage of the tournament. If Gareth Southgate hasn't started Ivan Tony at this point, he's never going to start him unless Harry Kane gets injured. But I would really hope in these next few games or in the next game specifically that um, if it's not going well, I want Gareth Southgate to make the change to take off Harry Kane sooner. Give Ivan Tony more of a chance to influence the game because I think Ivan Tony could do a, a business for this England team. He's got a good hold up play. He's fairly aggressive. Um, he's got a good shot on him. He can head out everything. Right, he's kind of a well rounded striker in that regard. I would much rather see Gareth Southgate. Please, for the love of God, please, for the love of God, take Kane off sooner. 
take Kane off sooner and then bring on Ivan Tony. Because I don't think it works the other way around. I don't think I'd want Kane to come on. I don't mind starting Kane, but if it's not working out, get get Ivan Tony on maybe on a 60, 70th minute and kind of get some fresh legs back in the team. Almost like how Holland used Weghorst. Holland used Weghorst in the same way. Weghorst comes in as an option to kind of, you know, change up the way Holland are playing, maybe have more of a target man. He's obviously good with the ball at his feet and stuff. I want to see more of a decisive change when it comes to substitution for Gareth Southgate. I feel like he's, he's a bit, he, he kind of divers in the same way that Ericsson Hag divers. So I want to see more decisive action. But regardless of that, the penalties. Oh, the penalties. The penalties, man. All England fans across the country, myself included, were so nervous in the penalties. We have such a horrible record in penalties in an international tournament. But these guys, they alleviate all our fears. They were so cool, calm and collected. Probably the only nerve-wracking penalty was Trent Alexander-Arnold at the end. But only because it was at the end. I don't think he was actually nervous himself. As Alan Shearer said, pressure is for tyres. Those players were so cool under pressure. Oh my God, man. It was so refreshing to see England players stepping up for penalties and they all knew they were going to score. They all tucked them in. They, they either sent the keeper the wrong way or they went to a side netting. Absolutely sublime. Honestly, I was so happy because the last thing you want, especially with those players being black, all five of them, by the way, Cole Palmer included, the last thing you want with our England players, especially the black ones, is for them to miss a penalty and suddenly everyone in the country forgets that they're English, forgets that they're British and starts fucking, you know, chucking racist, you know, insults at them and shit and starts questioning their loyalty, whether or not they're good enough and it just becomes a whole a run show of the summer of finding a scapegoat. So I'm glad those players were able to deliver at that stage. But it also shows, like, the confidence in the team. Because they were all brilliant take, brilliant, brilliant penalty takers. So I'm sure behind the scenes, the coaching staff knew that, hence why those players came on in the first place, obviously to try to affect the game. But if we went to penalties, we had the best ones on the pitch to take them. So I'm really happy about that. It does say something, though, that Harry Kane wasn't on the pitch to take one. That does say a little bit of something. Maybe his confidence is a little bit low or whatever. It does say something that your captain gets taken off and he doesn't take a penalty. You know what I mean, so it's a bit, that's a bit dodgy. But regardless, happy with it in general. Um, I thought Switzerland played really well. Also, I think they were really, uh, very unlucky. I was very surprised Shakiri didn't start the game because when he came on, he looked really dangerous. Obviously, he whipped that corner in that could have went in. He's just a attacking threat on that right hand side. When he cuts in, you know his ability to put balls into the box and shoot is uh, otherworldly. Um, I thought one of their wingers. I forgot which one it is. It might have been Vargas was playing very well. I think in the first half, he was really attacking and giving us loads of, loads of scares. I thought Mbolo, for as bad as he was, had some options, had some moments where he could have punished us. Like, Switzerland played very decently. I'm not going to lie. They played decently, but for sure they were one of the weaker oppositions we could have come across in this side of the tournament. But I'm happy we were able to put them to the sword and win at the end. And obviously, Trent Alexander-Arnold as well, penalty at the end, was fucking sublime. I, I, love when, I love when a player takes a winning penalty and they pick up the ball and kick it in the air. It reminds me of Cage. That is such a Cage Sunday League thing to do. You score the penalty at the end of the game, the game's finished, you just boot the ball up into the sky. Like, I fucking love that shit, man. I was gooning. I was going crazy in my room uh, watching that game, man. So I can't wait to watch the semifinals in a pub, actually. I'll probably try and stream on my phone or something so you guys can see where I go on or just enjoy it myself. But regardless, very, very infused. Amazing fucking game. Loved it all around and I can't wait for the semifinals now. I cannot wait for the semifinals now. I cannot wait for the semifinals now. Big up everyone in the stream chat. I appreciate you. Big up Victoria in Japan. Sorry, Victoria in Japan. Victoria in MMA. Why do you keep changing your name, man? Victoria MMA. Okay, big up Victoria MMA. AZ uh, Southgate is hilarious. Maino Pub was hilarious. Big up Chris Mack as well. Appreciate you, brother. What's Silverstone? Silverstone about to start. Round 16. Is on. Oh, Silverstone is, is F1, right? What's Silverstone? R round 16 in Wimbledon as well. Yep, 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 yep. Big up, big up, big up. Big up S, big up Louisiana, big up S, and big up everybody in Louisiana tuning into the guy. I appreciate all of you. Make sure you work hard and don't focus on me, okay? I'm just a random person, but I love, love you for tuning in. Big up Homeless Cat. Uh, yeah, of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. About the, We're going to talk about Jake Slater. Of course, we're going to talk about Jake Slater, Homeless Cat. You know what we're doing here. Big up Extra Fine as well. Um, big up everybody. Appreciate you. Appreciate. You, appreciate. You. Anyway, anyways, what wild one for homeless cat reading my mind? Wild one for homeless cat reading my mind? Huh? The next story on the list. 
the next story on the list is obviously about Jay Slater. So most of you guys know what's happening with Jay Slater. Uh, unfortunately, this young British teenager went out on a friend's holiday in Tenerife and hasn't been seen since. They went missing after a night out and people are trying to piece together what exactly went on. Now, I think, I think, I think personally, it doesn't really matter all the drugs and crime thing. I think the issue is that in the beginning, they tried to make it seem like that wasn't a thing. I guess the parents and the family wanted that not to be the focus because they knew that would take away from the focus on the search. I'm assuming so. But they tried to make him seem like he was a dams, I won't say dams in distress, but almost like a sweet, innocent boy type of thing, which wasn't the case. And I think a lot of people, people like myself, black people, might have been a little bit annoyed because we know if that was a black person, they had even, a, even an inkling, even a sprinkle of badness to their name, of like uh, you know nar the narrative will be completely spun into it being a completely different thing than some someone be missing at the end of the day a teenage boy is missing a family is without their son you know uh friends are without their best friend and shit this kid needs to be found one way or the other Do you know what i mean that's a major thing that's at play here but it's also revealing and exposing a real unsavory criminal underbelly of that island Tenerife right but which shouldn't be surprising um you know you you should be when you see where Tenerife is located when you see what type of business they do the economy and everything else it makes sense why this would be the case but it's really exposing the fact that no one really cares that this kid is lost everyone's just trying to protect themselves to not get exposed and to not get revealed what they do you know in in the shadows or at dark when the cameras are not watching because it seems like that place is just basically run on crime cash in hand airbnbs all this sort of madness going on at the same time so it seems like the worst place to go missing in a place like that because once you start getting the officials involved everyone starts to move a bit slowly because they don't want to have their spot blown up so it's a bit mad anyway all that to be said there's a couple of articles that just popped up that are very important to read and to kind of expose and to go over because they kind of give you an, an understanding of why Tenerife is the way it is and why the search for Jay Slater hasn't been the the most um the most fruitful. Let's just say that, right? So the current article here, courtesy of Daily Mail, Jay Slater, the county lines connection. Fred Kelly reveals the growing links between missing teens' final hours and the criminal underworld. So this is a thing in Tenerife. It's not like somebody trying to, you know, put a bad smudge on the place. This is just what it is. The nature of the beast. It's a party island. Party islands are going to sometimes attract some, you know, unscrupulous individuals. And with that comes some business that isn't all the way kosher. So let's read through the article. As night falls, the, Papa, the Papagayo Beach Club descends into a cauldron of noise and narcotics. This is the jewel of a somewhat sordid crown of the Veronica Strip, a collection of neon lit bars adjacent to the resort of Playa de Americas. Every night this week, in what we might call the post-A-level party season, hundreds of British teenagers filled this chaotic dance floor on what many was their first holiday without their families. By the way, just as a point, these kids are so lucky. I don't think I was ever allowed really to go anywhere with my friends and stay overnight even when I was that age, between the age of what, 16 to 18, 16 to 19. I think I went on my friend's, my first friend's holiday, maybe I was like 19, 20 to New York, but there was a lot of us, you know, and that was special circumstances, I think, for the most part. But these kids are going on like, a like you're in sixth form and you're going on a friend's holiday. I could never be allowed to, there were some holidays even, there were some even school trips domestically where, you know, the, the school went to, like, Kent or Devon and shit, and I wasn't allowed to go. So these kids being able to go abroad with their friends and drink and do drugs and hang out and fuck each other with this stuff, this is mad, man. Like, I, I wish I was given this sort of, like, freedom. But then on the other side of things, when these kids are this type of age and they're unexperienced in terms of, you know, doing drugs, drinking, going out, staying out, or, or being responsible... This is what happens also. So there's two sides of the same, you know, there's either side there where you can kind of decide on how to parent. Either you let your kid have all the freedoms and then you trust them to make the right decision and this may happen, or you keep them sheltered and then when they go out, they do too much because they're not used to doing anything. There is no right, I guess there is no right or wrong way to parent. It literally is a luck thing. It continues. When the mall, well, sorry, when the male visited Papagayo, the self-proclaimed icon of Canary Islands was full of bursting was full to bursting. 
But as the ear-shattering dance music bled, no one seemed to care or even remember that less than three weeks ago, the Mr. T and J said they'd been doing the exact same thing. Exactly. I can imagine right now, no one gives a fuck. If anything, it's probably making it more appealing because it makes it a bit dangerous. So more kids are probably going out there than ever. That's probably the case. But that's one thing I realized. I remember when I went to Fort Ventura, like a lot of those bars in those places to attract customers on the strip, they just crank up the voice. And again, maybe it's my audiophile music DJ sensibilities coming through and I'm sounding like a bit of a pompous, arrogant so-and-so. But I hate it when you hear music and it's almost redlining. It's, it's tearing your ears apart. It's like just ah, screeching. But these are what these bars do. They kind of just crank up the volume up into a red so that you can hear it from far and wide. But they're then competing with the other bars on the strip. So all this noise is bleeding into the strip. And it's just like tearing your ears apart. You can't really hear it. But they're trying to do it so that you, they can entice, you know, tourists to come into their bars. It's, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a crass method, but I guess it works. It continues. For it was here that a 19-year-old trainee bricklayer from Oswald Tissel in Lancashire spent the final night before his bizarre disappearance. Like many revelers, his mouth was open and jaw locked to one side, an expression consistent with ecstasy or ketamine abuse. It was the final hours of a three-day new rave generation music festival which he and three friends had flown out to attend. Yeah, there's actual, there's actual video footage of him actually in the rave and you can see him gurning, his jaw going from side to side and shit. But again, I don't think you can blame the drugs on this because everyone there is taking drugs for the most part. I just think, unfortunately, this is just like an, un an unfortunate series of events that led to his disappearance. But I don't think you can blame him on drugs. I think a lot of kids out there, even though they're really young, they seem to be a lot more sensible and able to do drugs than I would have been at that age because a lot of them come back home fairly safe so I don't think the drugs is, is, is at play I just think it's one of those you know unfortunate situations where he spoke or got into contact with the wrong people and then you know a series of events led to where he disappeared so it continues and this is the one that I want to get to this kid Ayub Kwasim 31 we need to get to that guy we need to get to this guy so let's roll down Having allegedly stolen a $12,000 or £12,000 Rolex watch from an unnamed Eastern European man outside the club, later allegedly sending a Snapchat message to friends saying he intends to sell it, Jay made what increasingly looks like an ill-fated getaway in a rental car of two mysterious men who drove the teenager to an Airbnb 25 miles north near the hilltop village of Masca. Now, they keep saying this 25 miles thing to make it sound far. The odd thing about islands, I'm sure some of you guys have noticed it, when you go to a foreign island, sometimes when you open your Google Maps, the places look really close than what they actually are. They're a lot closer when you're in a car, but when you're walking, it's further. Like, I think they said that distance was 25 miles. Allegedly, it takes like an hour to get from the club to where the Airbnb was. But they said if you wanted to walk from the Airbnb back to his accommodation, it would have took 11 hours. So those islands are weird in that way. So even though it seems far... I think every other kid there has probably gone to an after party of some dealer or some other person who lives there that's like half an hour away. You know what I mean? Of, of the main strip. Because usually strips are in one location. That's where the tourists live. And then outside of that is where like other people, regular people live and stuff. So I'm imagining if you're a regular dealer and stuff, you probably have a, a, a spot there. And most likely kids will go there and hang out with you and shit. So I don't think it's that, you know, crazy. The only sad thing about the situation is this, because I remember hearing about this, that he allegedly stole a watch. And obviously I heard as well um, that he stole the watch because he ran out of money for drugs. Allegedly he got there and like a good British person, he spunked all his money in the first day or two, had none left after saving up a bunch and then decided the smart decision apart from maybe calling his mum for, for send more money, telling his dad to send more money, borrowing money from his friends. The only decision he thought that would make sense <laughs> was to rob someone's watch. I don't know why. Maybe because he couldn't ask his mum, he was embarrassed, I don't know. But to go from not having money for drugs and alcohol to steal some guy's watch, and then unfortunately the guy that you watch that you steal is somebody quite well known who might be a gangster himself, is like, oh, how bad bad of the luck is that imagine and allegedly he did the thing that i have done before where i was so smashed one time in the club where i started talking to somebody i shouldn't have spoken to which then led to me getting chucked out and i think he did the same thing he was probably so smashed and high he wanted to sell the watch to somebody but he inadvertently was talking to somebody who was associated with that eastern european guy 
They took him back to the house to probably go teach him a lesson. I don't know. Maybe get the watch back, beat him up. Who knows what they're going to do? And then that's when, of course, he then fled the house. And then that's when he ended up getting lost. That's what I personally think happened, most likely. Or the most common explanation is that he was just drunk and on the come down, wanted to go home, was restless, couldn't wait for the bus, and just wandered off and got lost. That could be the easiest explanation. You know what I mean? Which is really sad too, because what? They're going to find him just like sitting somewhere on the side of a, a mountain. Like, pfft. anyway, it continues. And as is becoming alarmingly clear, there wasn't just any men. As the mail revealed this week, one of the pair has been identified as an Ayub Kwasim, who was jailed over nine years ago for being an architect of a sophisticated, extensive Class A drug operation across Wales. When approached by the mail, Kwasim 31, who booked an Airbnb under the name, simply said, The only comment I have to make is that Jay came to the house alive and he left the house alive. <laughs> That's a real dealer, by the way. That's a real drug dealer response. He does not give a fuck. If anything, all of this attention is probably taken away from his business. It's disturbing his business. It's maybe affecting his sales. Imagine a kid is missing that you last saw. And the only thing you want to say is that when he when, when I saw he was alive, when he left he was alive. You don't give a fuck. Honestly, big up Ali. Big up, what's his name? Um, Big up Ayub. Unfortunately, as the texture, as the true extent of Kwasim's murky past, this short response is proving hopelessly insufficient. Video footage, no, it now has been revealed that he is a close friend of drill rapper Potter Paper, 33, whose real name is Jamal Bowsba. Yo, are you listening to this? This kid, when it, that's what I'm saying. I think it's just like an unfortunate circumstances. This kid ends up getting into business or interacting with people who are very much linked to the criminal underworld. And one of the people is an associate of Potter Paper, one of our best rappers here in the UK, who just put out an incredible mixtape, by the way. Check it out with M. Honcho called 36 Hours. It's an incredibly good mixtape, a little a collaborative EP mixtape thing they put out. What a random thing. And if I'm not mistaken, Potter Paper also owns a cafe shop where they sell weed and shit over there. So, God damn it, man. This kid was just so unlucky. He just bumped into the wrong people, unfortunately. Or maybe the right people, because he needed drugs anyway, so who knows. Um, video footage from this year's MOBO Music Awards held in Sheffield shows Kwasim standing beside the prize-winning rapper wearing a garish diamond encrusted necklace. Kwasim also makes a cameo in one of the rapper's music video. Look at Daily Mail doing their classic racism shit. Why is it garish? Is it garish because a black man's wearing a diamond chain? Garish. Fuck off, you cunts. Anyway, it continues. And it turns out that Bausba um, also has form when it comes to drugs. He was sentenced to more than five years in prison for running a his own Class A narcotics operation in Barking, East London, which used a county lines at work of young people to deal drugs in provincial towns. Have you seen the connection? Tenerife is a place where um, post-A-level students go to rave and have fun. Kwasim Pelter Paper are known as dealers who specifically target those type of kids. Ah! He was released in 2020 and now owns a marijuana store in Tenerife called Potter's Garden, which sells multiple strains of cannabis, including one notorious plant known as Potter's Z. Bowser's soft spot for high strength cannabis is evident in his rap lyrics. One of his most popular tracks, Thanks for Waiting, opens with a line Nowadays, when I speak, it's a big saga. Nowadays, when I collab with a weed farmer, the song is also includes a line I don't smoke pagans, I smoke ganja spliffs. Cool. There, there's a there's a Ayub Kwasim, by the way. Um, what's more, Bowser is known associate and a friend of another more famous UK rapper, Big Nasty, who once had his own Channel 4 show and also owns Tenerife's biggest and most notorious coffee shop called BDL. The New Wave Generation Festival is held event there afternoon before Jay went missing. In other words, Jay Slater was not driven away from Papagayo by any normal fellow reveler, but by a convicted drug dealer with extensive ongoing connections to the narcotics trade in both UK and Tenerife. I don't think it's that... Imp Obviously, someone's partial and dictate how you judge them, but the fact that they're not digging more into that is a bit spooky. Maybe there's, you know, that, that Kwasim guy has links to the Spanish police and stuff and he's lining people's pockets. Who knows what's going on there? But it's pretty wild, isn't it? This kid ends up getting into contact with these types of people and then he ends up missing. Man, 
what is in um with this in mind it seems astonishing that police allowed Kwasim and other companion that night known only as johnny vegas to return to the uk no one by the way knows who johnny vegas is allegedly johnny vegas is some black guy but no one knows exactly who he is at the moment I, I, if i'm not mistaken not officially anyway the duo were questioned but most um immediately released by the spanish detectives investigating jay's disappearance with the police chief in charge of the operation claiming at the weekend that the pair were not in any way relevant to the case that seems questionable even by the standards of tenerife authorities who have a remarkably relaxed attitude to the island's drug culture as they should as they should i don't have any problems with the tenerife police do moving very slowly this is island life. If you've ever been to an island, ever been to a place outside of a metropolitan city, everything runs slow. The service runs slow. Police run slow. People walk slow. People talk slowly. On an island in Spain somewhere, yes, they're going to be slow. On an island in Spain somewhere that's run entirely on the party nightlife scene, whose entire GDP, GDP is determined by tourists coming in and spending an exorbitant amount on watered down cocktails and drugs and shit, of course it's important. I would wager a lot of the business that gets run on Tenerife is probably cash in hand business anyway. A lot of the actual business that keeps the lights on over there and keeps families fed, especially in the post-Brexit world, by the way. Think about that, right? Because I'm sure Brexit has definitely damaged and hurt their earning potential. Is run on cash in hand. So it's no surprise that Spanish police are not going out of their way to try and help. Because the last thing they want is for this to be uncovered and for stuff that they've done in the dark to come to light. They don't want that. They don't want it to cast aspersion on the country or the island itself. They don't want that. They would rather do what they're doing now, you know, taking it little by little, slowly by slowly, and then hope this kid ends up found by a miracle. But they don't want to overly invest their limited resources on an issue that they probably feel like is not their responsibility. Because if we're being really critical, if we're being really critical and honest, this kid kind of got himself in this position himself. It doesn't sound like he was taken against his will. This isn't like a Madeleine McCann thing. This sounds like a kid who got in over his head and paid the consequences, one way or another. This is what it sounds like, anyway. It continues. Meanwhile, there was no closer to solving the mystery of Jay's disappearance. As we know, at around 5 a.m. on Monday 17th, Jay Kwasim and a third man arrived at a 40 at night Casa de Abuela Tina rental property at around 7.30 a.m. Jay posted two images of himself on Snapchat, signaling that he was safe and well. 30 minutes after that, he was spotted at a nearby bus stop by Quifilia Medina Hernandez, whose brother owns the Casa Abuela Tina Airbnb. Ophelia told Jay the bus wasn't due until 10, but rather than returning to the property, he made the inexplicable decision to attempt to walk 25 miles south to his own lodgings. I'm still bemused why this lady, Ophelia, didn't offer this kid a lift. She allegedly saw him in the house with those two guys. She saw what state he was in. He then leaves the house to try and go home by himself. He's a tourist. He can't speak English and shit. You tell him how long it's going to take. You tell him how long the bus, is gonna, bus is going to take to get to the bus stop. You then drive back to the way that he's going or you drive out of the place and you see him as you're driving past. Why not tell him to jump in your car and that you'll drop him off at the nearest stop or a bit closer to the place so he doesn't walk so far? Why didn't she pick him up? I'm guessing, you know, she probably thought he was drunk and didn't want to get him in the car and the car moves around and he froze up in it or something. But I wonder if she feels any ounce of guilt because she might have been the last person to actually see him alive and she not at one point said, hey, jump in the car quickly. Let me go and take you to the nearest whatever so you can go home or take even to the strip so you can walk home from there. Come on, man. Anyway, this begs some questions. Had a weekend long binge left him tired, confused and behaving irrationally or did his fear for his safety at the Airbnb? Was he trying to escape from Kwasim, his associate, or someone else? Whatever the answer, Jay took the road north in the opposite direction to where his holiday apartment was situated. Apparently on the basis that it was a route recommended by... Oh, he went the wrong way. I didn't even know that. So he wasn't even going the right way. He was meant to, he was meant to go south, I guess, and he went north. That is so unfortunate. Um, according to Mark Williams Thompson, a former police officer who was unofficially investigating Jay's disappearance... So he leaves the Airbnb, he waits at the bus stop, he's, he's there at 8am, the bus is going to come at 10, I know how that feels, I'm sure some of you know how it feels, being in a foreign country, in a foreign place, waiting for public transport, it can feel longer than what it actually is, he's tired, he's dehydrated, he's coming down, he just wants to be in his bed, so he thinks, you know what, fuck it, I'll walk, but then he starts walking in the wrong direction, damn. 
Um, which makes sense why no one saw him because I guess if he was walking north, he was walking towards more of the rural part and not going towards the city. Because if he would have walked towards his accommodation, more people would have seen him. And then he would have probably been saved or helped or assisted and shit. Um, there's him with his mum. There's him in the background of a video at a club. Um, that's the Airbnb he went back to. Yeah, it's pretty far, isn't it? That's where he was partying, NRG, which is, you know, down towards the south. And that's where he was in the Airbnb. And he started going, oh, man, damn it. At 8.30 a.m., he called Bradley Hargreaves, a friend who had been traveling with him to Tenerife via Snapchat, saying that he'd left the road and was walking cross country. 30 minutes later, showing his first signs of distress, he rang a second holiday companion, Lucy May Law, to reveal that he was lost in the mountains with no water and 1% battery. Jay's phone then pings at 8.51 a.m. in the ravine where, uh, near the... So what? Is he in the water? Did he end up in the ocean or something? Is that what they're trying to say? His body might be in the ocean or he might be found in the ocean. God damn, bro. I still would say, as a word of caution for anybody, if you get lost... Don't phone somebody who isn't there to help you. You're better off trying to get yourself orientated with your map where you are and try to go in a general direction where you need to be than when you see somebody who's local, ask them for directions. But calling people and wasting your battery on that is a real waste of time, I think so personally. Waste of energy as well. Um, you're better off trying to, you know, situate yourself. Okay, where am I? Am I east? Am I south? Am I west? Go to the nearest point, try and find help and then go from there. Calling people is pointless. But I guess when you're distressed and panicking and young and first time holiday, all sense goes out the window. On Thursday morning, the mail visited the deep, treacherous ravine where rescuers had conducted the untimely, sorry, ultimately fruitless 12 day search. The terrain is unforgiving. Sharp needle cacti grow higher than the man's head and there's no sound other than the noise of geckos scuttling in the undergrowth and a distant howl of wind above the ravine. Alone in the morning heat, one false step could easily have led to a fall near the, cer near the um, certain death. In a sinister twist, the male found eerie signs of life in one or two ruined houndsteads, a ravine, shoelaces tied with twigs to form haunting symbols like something out of a horror movie. Climbing out of the ravine and looking back down the dense um, shrubbery, it is easy to see how a body could go undiscovered. One woman was who bravely refuses to give up hope of finding Jay is a devout mother, Debbie Duncan. Along with his father, Warren, and brother, Zach, she has been staying at the Club Tenerife Hotel in Los Cristianos, desperately hoping for good news, at the very least, closure. And I think people have said, although it looks pretty easy to navigate on camera, actually, when you're there, it's a bit wild. Like, it's like, you know, obviously on camera, it doesn't look that great. But yeah, it's very hilly loads of valleys everywhere you can easily get lost here so it, it looks kind of easy to navigate but it seems like a very treacherous place to kind of be irl we are a very close family and are absolutely devastated about his disappearance debbie said in a statement on tuesday words cannot describe the pain and agony we are experiencing he is our beautiful boy with his whole life ahead of him and we just want to find him yet jay slater case has certainly done little to dampen the fuse of revelers kevin molly a 22-year-old from Ireland is on a nine-week holiday in Tenerife with his girlfriend as they both enjoy a long summer away from college. Nine weeks? Wow, bro. That must be fun. That must be f -f 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 fun Jay disappeared three weeks into his trip, but Kevin barely registered it. <laughs> Kevin doesn't give a fuck. A bartender mentioned it to me, but otherwise I haven't seen any posters or anything. Just what I've read online. Wow. So this, this feels like it's international news, but in Tenerife, they're literally paying it no mind because it's bad for business, right? You don't want to see a missing kid's face on posters all over the city. You want kids just to kind of revel and have fun and go crazy. Mad. Indeed, the internet has become a cesspit of conspiracy theories propagated by amateur sleuths. It's impossible to know what to believe, admits Kevin, who's clearly unconcerned. But others are taking Kev J disappearance more seriously. Two 20-year-old Hollywood makers called Harry and Ed are enjoying a week away. We're certainly more wary now. Our families warned us to be careful and we won't be going to Veronica's. You don't have to do much. Just don't go to strangers. In the most part, in my personal opinion, don't go back to dealers' houses for afters. If you want to get drugs from them, tell them to bring the drugs to you there. Um, get whatever they're offering you at the moment. But there's no need for guides, especially, to go back to dealers' homes. There's no point. If you're a girl, it's a different story. Maybe they want to smash. Maybe you want to smash. Maybe you want to smash to get free drugs. That you have to roll the dice on your own. 
But the idea of leaving a, a, a party to go to a dealer's for afters is a bad idea. You're better off going to an afters with other ravers, with other kids your age, apart from going with some adults. It doesn't make any sense. It, that's what I would say anyway, if I was going. Just don't go back to an afters with a dealer. Go with somebody that's your own age. And even then, keep your eyes and ears open and shit. Just minutes before taking talking to the male, sorry, the pair have been approached near the strip in the middle of the day and offered Charlie, which I which I think means cocaine. I think. Look at Harry. Look at Harry. Which I think means cocaine. All right, Harry, you think so, right? Okay. I had a similar experience while walking down the Veronica's in the early afternoon. A group of North American men are proposing to sell knockoff designer sunglasses approached me. What are you selling? I asked them. A grin came across the face of one of them street hawkers says, cocaine, marijuana, come with me, my friend. It was as simple as that. So the same guy selling you glasses could also sell, sell you a party pack. I might have to go to Tenerife, mate. Tenerife sounds like a good place. Might have to get some new podcast glasses and some yak. <laughs> The latest revelers, um, the latest revelation story about the drug links in the Jay's last known association with as um, Ayub Qasim only deepened the suspicion that his disappearance is some kind of link to the scene thriving. Oh, let me repeat that again. My reading is so horrible today. The latest revelations about the drug links of Jay's last known associate Ayub Qasim only deepened suspicions that his disappearance is in some way linked to the island's thriving narcotics trade. It's an association that has begun to tarnish the name of Jay Slater, who was previously conviction for assault. Again, that shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. But, you know, United News is they whitewash it when it comes to white victims. They're perfect. They do nothing wrong. If it's a black student... Number one, they wouldn't have this innocent picture of him. It'd be a picture of him throwing up a gang sign, a picture of him with his watch or something. It'd be something crazy like that. They would never make them look nice and sweet. So that's the only problem that people have. But again, at this point, it doesn't matter what he did in his past. Let's find the kid. Continuing. There's more to this than meets the eye. A man in his 50s told the male. He's belly bulging over Wolverhampton Wanderers football shorts. <laughs> UK, that's UK heritage there. I read that Jay's past. He isn't your average young man. Something doesn't add up. No, I think that is your average young man. I think your average young man who's brought up in a rough part of England has probably had some sort of assault case on them. Maybe not been convicted, but they've definitely been involved in some madness. I don't think it's that crazy. And your average young man is probably partying and drinking and doing drugs. It's probably There's probably an exception of, you know, there's probably a small amount of kids who don't do that. So I don't think he's that crazy or that out of the norm. Jay said is not the only British teach teen to go missing in Tenerife. Kevin Ainley, 24, also from Lancashire, was working as a promoter for a bar when he disappeared just over two decades ago. That's really sad to hear, isn't it? This guy called Kevin Ainley disappeared two decades ago and he's still missing. In 2019, a 34-year-old father of two, Peter Wilson, went missing after a night out. His body was found two years ago, um, two years later at, a, at the bottom of a sheer drop beside a shopping mall. Both of these disappearances represent tragedies for their families. Oh, that's that doesn't seem good, does it? It must be forgotten that the heart of Jay's story is a mother who desperately clinging on to the hope that her son is still alive. But sadly, as the days go by in Tenerife, Debbie Duncan's desperate calls for help has becoming even further fainter, drowned out by the fudding dance music pervades in the Torres Party Island. God damn! Yeah, I'd imagine I'd because the landscape of Tenerife is really odd. Because judging by uh, Big Up Chris Mack, yes, I, I would imagine a shopping mall there. Because the landscape from what I've seen, like all of the, there's loads of hills like this. Loads of hills. And then all the towns are kind of down at the bottom of the hill. So it makes a sense why somebody's body could get dropped down a hill and end up at the side of a shopping mall. Because all the residential areas are like at the bottom. No, sorry. All the strips and the shopping malls are like at the bottom. And all the residential areas are like, are like the top. But there's not a lot of things in between. Um, given how touristy it is, it's, it's kept some of its kind of rugged, rustic, natural, you know, beauty. There's not a lot of like uh, developments or homes. It's all basically like this. So it's a strange place how it's kind of laid out, essentially. Um, big up uh, Chris Mack. If, if her brother owns an Airbnb and being booked under a fake name by a drug lord, it's entirely possible she's involved somehow. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. And I'd imagine too, Having known dealers in the past, dealers usually don't carry a lot of stuff with them because you don't want to get caught by the police with, with it on you. So maybe it's very common for dealers in that place. If kids want more drugs for the night out, they tell them to come back to their place. And you obviously have to have some deal in place with the Airbnb person so they don't, they, so they don't snitch on you. So you maybe slide them a bit of money to keep quiet 
and then you can store your drugs at their house and these are good upstanding citizens who are not involved but you just use that as like a stash place and place to sleep you know what i mean and maybe fuck random girls and shit and then when they want to come they come through they get some extra drugs and they leave and it's obviously far, far away from the strip as well so it kind of avoids suspicion so yeah that, that makes a good point chris man that's a really good point maybe that airbnb woman was involved hence why she didn't want to pick him up do you know what i mean yeah, that's a very, very, very good point. I never thought about that, actually. But, um, yeah, hopefully Jay Slater gets found. As the days go by, obviously, it's not looking likely that he's going to be found alive. But you never know. Miracles have happened. So let's see. But, I again, like I keep mentioning with this story, I just hope this is a lesson and a cautionary tale to kids going out. It's okay to do whatever you want to do, drink, drugs, whatever it is. But just be responsible. Have some semblance of balance. Know kind of where you're situated at. Always have an exit plan. And just, you know, take things easy. Because if it is true, the original story that he, he, he wound up in a position where he stole a watch because he ran out of money, it just goes to show that, you know, just the excitement is just too much. Just take it easy, you know, take it, take it, take it, take it easy. Um, there's no need to spend so much money and go so crazy. There's no need to fucking go panic with the drugs as well, especially on an island like that. Even if you do run out of drugs, somebody else will offer you some. You'll get some some other way. You've got friends with you. You could always share with them. Like, it's not that big of a deal. Like, you don't need to go, you know, to such an extreme measure to get money to go buy drugs and or drinks and to continue the party. It's not that big of a deal. But I'm hoping that could be a lesson learned after the fact. But I hope this kid gets found. I hope this kid gets found moving on moving on let's talk a little bit let's talk a little bit a little bit about about the club that i want to go to in essen called open ground open ground in essen is the new popular club that everyone wants to go to allegedly the sound system is one of the best um, people are alleging it's even better than Robert Johnson. It's even a equaling or coming close to kind of emulating Berghain and how good their sound system is. But in general, people have a lot of good things to say about it. And with it being in Essen, um, which is a city just maybe a 17 miles or so from Dortmund and shit, um, it's obviously a place that's not Berlin. It's obviously a place that's a little bit more cheaper to go and visit, especially as a tourist like myself, um, maybe more cost effective. But I have heard it's not the most funnest place to be at there's not much to do there so maybe it's not a place to go to for a whole long weekend like i would go if i was going to berlin and stuff but it might be a place to go to between like you know maybe friday and sunday and shit but allegedly people have had a lot of good things to say about it people are absolutely waxing lyrical about it let me actually check quickly here coach your google reviews some reviews that people are saying about it here um oh there's actually a one star review two hours ago big up the one star review one star review of open ground as of two hours ago i really don't understand why such a nice club is run down so badly with consistently bad music i was there three times bad music three times everyone in the smoking area reported it and was disappointed there were six people on the dance floor at 8 2 a.m of course readers can afford to drive the club to the wall but i don't understand why hmm not too sure if i buy this i guess there is i have heard some people say some nights can be quite empty because it's still, you know, a new club. It's getting, you know, it's kind of getting out there and stuff. But again, it's not in a popular German city and it's still relatively new. So people are still basically finding it and slowly but surely it will get to that place. But um, I don't know if I'm buying that music was bad the entire night, but we never know. Another person here four days ago says, was a very great evening with live set from Caliber and Breakage. The system is really nice. The atmosphere and the people there are pleasant. The staff at the door and the bar are really nice. I would like to come back for a super little event. Another person says, um, I will name my two children. What? I will name my two children after the person who is responsible for the system on the main floor. Then there's also Bergman Special from the old homeland. I have rarely been so positively surprised. The only point where you should start is perhaps the light. The muted lighting, the ambience itself is great, but the LEDs on the ceiling are more of a plastic Christmas tree variety. Nevertheless, the store would have earned a solid six points as if someone popped up on a table, the club owner's meeting with a flag and said, and said this is how you do it. Wow. This person loves the club so much they would name their kids after the person who designed the, the, the fucking sound system. Incredible. Um, another one says, absolutely not a fan. Been there twice. Music is really for lovers. Unfortunately, I've, I almost fell asleep. 
the people on the counter are very nice the people at the door not so much we didn't let a person in the birthday group because they didn't look right completely incomprehensible because the club was empty this sounds like somebody who went with a crew for their birthday somebody in the birthday crew was too fucked up most likely the birthday boy or the birthday girl and they weren't allowed in that's that's a common thing but i, I don't think that's a fair assessment of a club incredible sound experience blah 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 anyway all that to be said open ground have done a really great thing i guess maybe this is a way for them to attract more tourists like myself to go there because they've published a program all the, all the way from july until november usually clubs don't do that usually clubs give you like a month in advance but they have published an entire program and lineup for cl for their club nights they're going to be doing their and events all the way until november pretty wild so you can sift through the entire lineup and see who you want to go and check out here um you got fatty mohem obviously bergan resident playing there you got f Demin and alitin bus playing as well um you got clarissa playing um obviously some of the better ones are down below you got ben sims uk stand up you got dvs1 playing on the 8th of november this is definitely one i'm gonna go to and then you've also got, I think, a Freddie K night happening on the 29th. So I'll probably end up going there twice in one month, actually, for the DVS and Freddie K. But they have published an entire, entire lineup of people playing all the way until fucking November. So if you're on the fence about going um, and you don't know um, what to do, I'd recommend checking out the list. There's plenty of great people playing. Actually, Fadi Mohem is playing there quite often. I wonder if he's not a burger guy in Raisin anymore. He's, he's, I see his name on here quite often. I wonder what's happened to Fadi Merriman Bergheim. But um, he's on there quite a lot as well. So loads of great people playing there. Bessie Hero is also playing there. Um, coming up, who I'm a big fan of. V um, Veal I like as well. Um, who else do I know here? DJ Brom I know as well. Um, and a few others. But obviously the main... And Blau One, of course, I would also check out. But the main one, the main one, the main one I would check out the main one I'll check out is obviously Freddie K on the 29th and of course DVS1 on the 8th on the 8th on that sound system it's going to be fucking pucker and I'd assume there'll be a big crowd out there too so I'm really curious to see Wagwan and see what it's like I can't wait to check it out um let's actually check out a little bit about the what they say in the FAQ the FAQ welcome to open ground commit to originality independence and expanding horizons whoever you are whatever your background we invite you to join us with an open mind and share a great experience of sound system music in an inclusive expectful club environment we strive to create a space where you can be yourself enjoy the night and look after each other we don't tolerate racism sexism or any other form of discrimination at the door when you enter the club we'll welcome you and lay out some of our policies bags and pockets will be checked for non-allowed weapons or items or is we reserve the right to refuse access to the case of drunk aggressive or otherwise inappropriate behavior okay let's do we have any pictures on here do we have any pictures of what the club looks like on the inside or we do have to go and see it all with our eyes let's see what one yeah all with your eyes nothing really there only two from the outside it's kind of like a bunker type of affair almost like an underground station where you go down and check it out but i'm curious to see what it looks like layout and all that malarkey when i end up going there in november yeah but big up november can't wait to check it out blah 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 oh i like this by the way they got a guest book post on their page that features all the instagram stories post of people who say the club is amazing that's a really cool little idea believe the hype open ground club is it thanks for the start the staff and the dancers and cave MC see you next time so there's a cave in party there okay pretty cool um loads of posts from people um d bridge says so Warpital, what can i say that every dj who plays it hasn't said already these spaces are rare it's the kind of club that can birth a new scene if i was younger i'd go live there for six months and write music from that system oh i love that idea shout out to the open ground for creating this space in a time when clubs are closing if there's your local support and get inspired yeah that would be actually a great place to go as quiet and as probably boring as a town as it is if you actually did want to create some interesting some very creative very far-reaching open mind expanding work you probably would go to a smaller city like that and just situate yourself there and go there every fucking weekend and then spend the rest of your week you know working a part-time job and obviously creating fucking art that'd be a great way to actually go so big up d bridge amazing message there um someone called aku aqua aqua b says thank you open ground it was a pleasure to return and play again such a beautiful space and it's so great to see how it's continuing to evolve much love to the amazing team involved uh, for all of your care and dedication i truly encourage all you to visit it yet take a trip to world tour to experience it 
So everybody's raving about it. Open ground bracelet there from Fidel. What a great sound experience on this stunning PA. Thanks for the ravers who came down to party. P.S. A cup of tea right after the set is something really nice. Um, I like something stronger, but what do you do? In someone called Interdimensional Jojo. Um, open ground so beautiful every detail is taken care of the sweetest and coolest people behind this place you'll want to check this out trust me it's a hidden gem thank you so much for having me wow okay i love this this is such a great idea by the way um this guest post i'm not gonna lie because i think i saw the same thing with people posting um uh, on what you call it i see it i see it. i see people posting anything about Bergheim. When they're standing outside. Look at all these posts, man. Wow, everyone's fucking sucking this club off. I need to fucking go. Tasha's got a big comment here. What did Tasha say? Tasha says, when I first stepped in to this special place, I was looking up through the circle and we're like, where the fuck am I? The soundproofing alone is amazing. It's impressive. I hadn't felt this level of excitement since my first time at Fold. Ooh, nice. Good. That's a good association. If it's a good at Fold, it's going to be a sick club. I had the same feeling before Plastic Peoples, another legendary London club. Again, last week at Basayini, uh, which I have to go to. That's in Georgia. I haven't been there yet. Big up all my Tbilisi, mandem. The sound comes first. The magic builds around it. I used to go to Plastic People alone and a lot of the time immerse myself deep in the sound. Same here. Big up Plastic People, RIP, legendary venue. Hearing elements of a tune I didn't even know existed before. At Forward, the gut-wrenching bass, haha, even inside the annex room of the open ground, the strip of red light behind the booth reminded me. Yes, Laurie Applebim already said it we were discussing it in the rain in the train sorry after the very special unforgettable first night there saying how lucky we are to say that we are there the opening weekend like those who were opening weekend at Hacienda but seriously it's the spot the freed the the fried failed room is nuts the first sound check i clocked so many different elements in tunes i thought i knew inside out that i hadn't before the sound just envelops you moves you everywhere every way so amazing to see people deep in the music literally getting moved by the sound proper proper feeling it dancing to dj p caliber steny and playing with josie there was pure joy well i can't wait I bet this isn't the place to go. I couldn't play there. I couldn't go play there with my YouTube rips, right? I couldn't play there with my YouTube rips. You need to have some proper, proper WAV files or proper high quality 32 KPS tunes. I couldn't go there with my fucking iTunes, my Instagram and YouTube rips. They, they, they wouldn't work. They would probably be, I'd probably be exposed there. Have to crank up the levels. <laughs> YouTube rips probably wouldn't work at open ground. You need some high quality tunes then. But yeah, loads of good fucking um reviews and feedback from loads of DJs here. Um another person here says, um, that's GGFM. Words cannot compare the feeling, the soul, the body high to get from this club. This is out of this world sound system. Thank you for having me open ground. I haven't danced in my whole body this way in so long. Um couldn't have asked for a better night out with Altibas and Quelza. Wow, man. Okay. This is a really good idea, the guest book. Honestly, this is a really clever idea. Having all these DJs posts sucking the club off and giving it praise all in one place so that you can kind of, you know, as I am, as a raver, get a boner from reading it and want to go. This is a really good idea. I really fucking like this. I'm still speechless and overwhelmed about what happened at Open Ground this night. Thank you to DRBRT for being my companion since day one. Thanks to Edith Min. Um, thanks to Rifts um, for the good company. Open Ground for the welcome. Arthur666 for the trust. Thanks for all my friends supporting me. It's inspiring to see these kind of spaces from the lady machine. Thank you for the team with a warm welcome. Bloody hell. Warm welcome, warm welcome. Thank you, 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 thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm coming, man. I'm coming. I'm coming. In my German accent, I'm coming. Mind coming, mind coming. Mind coming. Okay. I'm going to be there, please. Anyway, I'm going, I'm going. If you haven't been there, please check it out. Again, like I said, they've got an entire lineup, entire lineup of the club um calendar has been listed until november check it out don't be lame mix up your places to go to don't always go to fucking bergen all the time go somewhere else go somewhere else yeah big up nj ranger mine coming mine coming <laughs> and shortigan mine coming <laughs> danke schön danke schön mine coming 
<laughs> big up Robert Minas, Shades Cow, I see you. So yeah, big up Open Ground. Um, check out the website, openground.club and also check out them on uh, Instagram as well. Links should be on their main website, openground.club. Work at all, check it out. Don't be lame, check it out. Talking about not being lame. Talking about not being lame. Let's talk about one of my favorite places in the world. Bergheim. Bergheim have just released their August 2024 lineup and it's absolutely br bristling with some great people to go and check out. Great raves to go check out. So if you're in Berlin on August and you see the kid, make sure you wave because I will be there. If you see me in August in the big old, what do they call it? Do they call it BX or is it BR or is it BL? I don't know what the abbreviation of Berlin is. Whatever the abbreviation is, check out. I'll be there in that big space, stepping all over shit and stuff, gooning in the corner of fucking clubs, doing my best fucking TikTok techno shuffle. I will be there. But the lineup is pretty, pretty good. The first place, the first place I want to check out and I want to recommend has to be the Pan Night. Pan nights are pretty special because I feel like they go out of their way to book artists at Panel Bar who probably would never play in Bergheim if it weren't for Pan. So I think it's important to go to Pan Night because you'll probably hear stuff at Panel Bar you would probably never heard played there. Even though Panel Bar is probably the more freer of the two rooms, Bergheim main space is usually more techno you can know what to expect there but in panorama bar you're probably going to expect some house some ebm some disco some pop shit r&b hip-hop whatever you could probably expect that in that space so if you do go there i would actually recommend going to a pan night forget Bergheim, just to experience a different sort of sound in that space which you wouldn't hear anywhere else and the one person who i would point out as somebody that i would love to check out there if i went would be a person called bad sister bad sister plays um what's it called um funk caracal brazilian funk um music which has been all the rage here in london people are absolutely loving it so i recommend checking her out if you haven't already i actually play a video where you can see what her style is like because she's fucking fire so if you're going to Bergheim, i definitely recommend checking out bad sister she's definitely one of the better djs out there and i would actually love to see that sound played on that system in that club at that time that'd actually be a pleasure to go and check out so definitely check out bad <laughs> And the good thing about music like this, right, is that you rarely hear it when you're in Berlin anyway. You rarely hear this type of music in Berlin in the first place. So it's a pleasure. It's a real pleasure to hear that sort of sound in a place like Bergheim. Because people usually think of it being strict and very rigid about what can be played and can't be played there. And the punters can be a little bit entitled and demanding about what they want to hear you play. But I think those pan nights are great places to maybe mix it up and see things that you probably would never see in that sort of space. So definitely recommend checking out Bad Sister because she's fucking brilliant. <laughs> Can you imagine seeing people twerk in, in Panama? I don't think I've seen a single person twerk in Berlin. Obviously, there's not many black people there to twerk in the first place. But in general, could you imagine how sick it will be to be in Pano Bar and seeing people twerking? <laughs> that might actually be quite fun. So I recommend you check out uh, Bad Sister. She's fucking pucker. So Bad Sister's playing at the Pan Night on the 2nd of August. I recommend you check that out on the Friday. Um, obviously, DJ Maria, I'm a big fan of Bestie Hara. I fucking love. She'll be there on the following day. Bergheim Main Room, you've got Paramita, who I'm also a big fan of. Uh, uh, Mass Milano Paraglaria is obviously playing there as well. Solar is playing there. Um, there's actually a night on the Thursday that's pretty good, a weirdo's night that features Boys Noise, right? Boys Noise playing, um, that should be pretty decent. And also James Newmarsh, if I'm not mistaken, that's the guy from Fold. He's one of the, 
managers there and also a resident. He plays with um, Voice Drone, one of the other founders there. So James Umar just playing. That's a pretty big booking for him. I don't, cause I don't think he's, he DJs professionally. I think he mainly works, obviously, DJs part-time. But still, it's a good look um, for him to be there. I wonder if we're going to see Voice Drone playing in Bergheim soon. Maybe we'll see a fucking unfold night in Bergheim. Imagine that. Imagine there being an unfold night in Bergheim soon. That's pretty sick. So James Newmars playing London stand up. Big up him. And obviously that'll be a good thing to check out on the Wednesday. Um, who else do I recommend here? Um, I would probably skip this particular night on the 10th, even though you've got Orgazon playing. Natalie Sarah's I'm a big fan of. Annabelle Gaspar I love. Actually, no, definitely do this the 10th. The 10th, you got Quelza. you got Wata um I Igarashi, the Japanese DJ, um, he's fucking sick. Um, obviously, you got Blanca playing Beatrice. That's a very solid lineup, the 10th. That's a very, very solid one. But then again, on the following weekend, look what the, this is the one that I want to go to. This is the one that I want to go to because I want to go twice in that month. Look at this week. On this particular week on the 15th, you've got Boris playing all night long and in Seoul, which is the other room, which is kind of like the live venue type of thing. So I'm curious to see what they're going to do. I'm curious if it means if he's going to play behind the decks. Is he playing live? I don't know. But I think the Seoul room is usually the room where they have bands playing and shit and other performances but that should be pretty sick um and they've got some really cool seating areas and stuff to sit down in so that's th that's a good place to go to if you want to rave and you're an old person you want to sit down so boris who's like you know a quasi bergheim resident and a bit of a legend for the type of stuff that he plays very kind of eclectic taste levels loads of you know he might play synth pop he might play some ebm he might play some disco, some house, some hip-hop. He's all over the place, but he's really good. He's fun. And then the following night, you've got a reef night featuring Batu, Darwin, uh, Varako, DJ Storm, Espacito, I'm a big fan of. Then the following Saturday, Don Williams, Francois X, Jesse G, Polignana, bloody hell, Steffi. Come on, bro. This is a big lineup, man. And Zombies in Miami. Zombies in Miami are very underrated, I feel like, party DJ group. Um, they mostly play, I, I, I'd say it's mostly like indie dance, disco, new disco type of vibe, but they are sick. I've seen them once before, but they are really fucking good. Duo. It's like a man and a woman. They're fucking cool. So I'd rec I recommend you checking out Zombies in Miami if you're that way inclined. Um, what else do we have here? We have a key magazine one. This I probably wouldn't, would, I probably would avoid. Probably going to be a lot, too many TikTok ravers in this one. Had one, Tommy47, not for me, even though I, I don't mind those producers. I would skip that. And then the one I would go to, actually, of the all of these, is the one on the 31st. So the two nights I probably will think about going, it's probably this week, the 15th to the 17th. And then, of course, the 31st of August. The 31st of August, you got Baker playing live, um, Answer Code Request, DJ Pete, one of the best djs ever personally in my opinion i've seen him play a fucking paloma bar alongside um what's his face um the guy that does uh power disco i forgot his fucking name now um but apologies for you but i saw him play there absolutely incredible etap kyle playing as well that should be pretty fun um because he's changed up his style as well nastia regal i'm not really sure who that is um alex cassian big up um uk stand up on that one that should be good alinica playing arm playing good jansen playing like Rex the Dog in South, that should be a good one. This should be a real barnstormer. The 31st and the 15th are for me, are probably the best ones in terms of nights there. Or the 17th, sorry, 17th and the 31st, definitely the best ones for me to check out. So if you're that way inclined, check it out. But loads of good people playing. Um, I recommend you check out Bergheim's website to see all of the amazing DJs who will be playing in Bergheim in August. Amazing fucking lineup. But I'm definitely looking forward to the 15th, the 16th and the 17th. And of course, the 31st. Barnstorming nights out barn storming nights out talking about barn storming nights out i saw this post on the bergan community subreddit and it made me wonder it made me wonder about the desire for some people to want politics reflected in every area of life and i personally think unpopular opinion i don't personally think raves clubs music in general should be political it should be apolitical obviously if you want to be political yourself and express your thoughts and feelings cool but i don't think it's necessary or necessity when it comes to a nightclub i would much prefer prefer i would much prefer it be a politically neutral platform 
whether you're on one side or the other side, you can express your views. I don't really agree with what Hor did, where they were taking people's scarves away, when they were trying to protest in favor or in support of the Palestinian people and shit. I think that's abhorrent. You shouldn't be taking people's flags, Israeli, Palestinian, doesn't matter. Be politically neutral. But I think having a stance and then allowing that stance to influence who you book and who you don't book, I think is a bit dumb because music by its very definition should um, be a, an overarching umbrella should be a space that welcomes all people regardless of what political leadings you have if anything there should be no point to discuss in the dance floor no one fucking wants to know about that everyone wants to drink everyone wants to snort everyone wants to suck and fuck and that's it that should be the main reason why you're going to a club not to have your politics echoed on the dance floor that's bullshit in my personal opinion but allegedly there have been some people who have been unhappy that Bergheim haven't spoken out or haven't really made it clear where they stand when it comes to the Israel-Palestinian thing, right? Uh, when it comes to, sorry, when it comes to the, of course, the genocide of the Palestinian people at the hands of the Israeli government. So in this particular aspect, I don't mind what Bergheim is doing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing that Bergheim are keeping their nose out of it and just basically allowing whoever goes to play at Bergheim, if you want to make it political, you can. If you're very on one side or the other side, it's not going to affect them booking you. But I also respect the DJs who are foregoing playing at Berghain because of their political leanings. That takes a lot of courage because we all know how big of a club that is and how much it matters and how important it is to play there and what it can do for your career and blah, 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 blah. If there are people who have the courage of conviction, if there are people who are so steadfast in their point of view that they're willing to, you know, um, affect their career negatively by not going and playing at that place because it doesn't allow their political leanings only respect given to them but I don't think they should be forced Bergheim to make a stand or make a stand make a start make a you know have a stance publicly either side either way I don't think so I think it's a good thing that they're probably being neutral keeping stum and just allowing the people who play there to share whatever they want to share and that's basically it but this is according to the Instagram page, Ravens of Palestine. This is something I didn't know, by the way. It's posted on Bergen subreddit and people were talking about it. I had no idea this was a thing, but allegedly people have been boycotting and not playing there, which might explain why a lot of the lineups I've read recently haven't been as like blockbustery and shit. They've been still good because I think Bergheim's one of their strengths is their programming. I think for such a big club, they do such a great job in terms of always, for the most part, having very good lineups. Like most months are like seven out of 10 is the mid is the lowest, I think, which is a really hard thing to do because there's only a finite amount of like really good high level DJs anyway. And you're also a massive club. So to keep having all your months be very, very good, seven out of 10 is also, you know, goes to show that that place is run correctly. But I've noticed in the last few months, there's been a distinct lack of really like blockbuster names. So that could be because people are staying away on purpose. According to his post on Ravis of Palestine on Instagram, it says as follows on the caption, if you've looked at Bergheim lineup recently, you may have noticed an increasing predominance of residents and local artists. This isn't due to a change of their booking policy. We know that at least 40 DJs have pulled out of Bergheim gigs in solidarity with Palestine. The exodus began with an underground artist, but now extends to some of the biggest international names in techno. Again, pretty good. Because one thing we've noticed during the pandemic, some of the biggest DJs in the world refused to take time off. They were playing plague raves. They were going and traveling to third world countries where their laws and their regulations were a little bit more lax and taking advantage of it and still playing. So big time DJs have no shame in terms of playing when they're not meant to play and keep on playing for the money, right? They don't give a fuck. No matter how rich they are, they're going to keep on playing. So the fact that some of these people are not playing at one of the biggest clubs in the world is maybe proof that maybe some of them have a little bit more courage a little bit more principles and morals than I think they would. Now, don't get me wrong, Bergheim doesn't pay as much as some of the bigger clubs out there, some of the bigger festivals or some places in general, because I've heard that they keep their fees pretty low, but the opportunity to play there is the best. So people take the opportunity to play there over the fee. But regardless, you have to give these guys praise because, you know, there's not a lot of people that actually have the courage to stand up for their convictions. So if people are doing it, fair play. But then it made me think about this whole, you know, boycott anyway. And I was surprised when I read, when I, when I scroll down on Ravens of Palestine, this is actually a thing. So if I scroll down, this is actually a thing. So this is actually a thing people are doing. And according to Ravens of Palestine, 
people have also asked the question, is it counterculture? Is boycott and burger in counterculture? Um, I don't for think it's counterculture. I think it's a bit unnecessary just because they don't want to make a stance or have a position either, either side. I don't think that makes them complicit. You know what I mean? It doesn't make them, you know, um, Zionist. It doesn't make them, you know, um, endorsers of the IDF or anything. So, so they just don't want to be involved. Or they don't want to get overly political. I think that's everyone's provoc everyone's provocative. Like if you're, you're allowed to not have an opinion on politics, I think so. But let's say what they say. Curse you of Ravens of Palestine. A great number of DJ have been withdrawing their labor from Bergheim in solidarity with Palestine. Again, these the words that they use, political people, their labor. Like what? Um, however, some of us are still choosing to cross the picket line. We understand that this venue has a particular legacy on its own scene and want to move with empathy and good faith. In the next slides, we address some common questions around the boycott. Music is about peace and unity. Isn't boycotting cancer culture? They say. Boycotts are centuries old form of political resistance deployed in many historic struggles from the Montgomery bus boycott to the apartheid. <laughs> Honestly, don't they see how preposterous and ridiculous they sound by attributing not playing at a nightclub to the apartheid in South Africa? Like, come on, man, wind your neck in. It's just music. It's not that deep, bro. Anyway. Right now in Germany, artists, mainly black, Muslim and Jewish, are being targeted, surveilled and even arrested by the state. Bergheim's deplatforming and mistreating of Arabian Panther. Ah, oh, that Arabian Panther person is a little bit of a psycho anyway. So that's not really a good place to kind of put it from. But let's continue. This boycott is targeted effort to resist the crackdown, get accountability from venues and create a pressure for an end to the genocide in Gaza. That's what I don't understand. They honestly think if you if you put pressure on Bergheim, they think that's going to somehow lead to a ceasefire. The ceasefire is only going to happen if you put pressure on the politicians. Clubs can't affect the ceasefire. Protesting in the streets is going to affect a ceasefire. Not clubs. I don't know about you, but I don't think clubs are that powerful. Every time a DJ crosses the picket line to play at Berghain, they send a message that censorship is acceptable. No, they don't. They send a message that they don't give a fuck. They said, which you're allowed to. You're allowed to not care. And you're allowed to not be judged if you don't care. Like, I don't understand how not caring and not having an opinion is almost as bad as having an opinion. Like, what? This empowers other clubs to deplatform artists and undermines the efforts in Germany and other Western countries. Okay, whatever. Another slide. Isn't it better to take the gig and donate my feet to Palestine? What if I what if I wear my kufya on stage? Sure, you can do this for every club that is not being actively boycotted. <laughs> sure, but not that club. Okay. But for live venues being boycotted, please don't cross the picket line. Solidarity works when it's collective and united. Every time a DJ branches off and decides their own way to help, it undermines the resolve of the movement and spreads confusion and encourages other artists to ignore the boycott. What about if your reasons and the way you approach the boycott are just wrong? What about that? What about if I have a difference of opinion? What about if I support your boycott, but I don't want to boycott myself? What about that? Um, am I not allowed? So you have to you have to sacrifice your progression of your career to help a boycott that's trying to call for a ceasefire that isn't going to happen off the back of you boycotting. The ceasefire is going to happen when you put pressure on politicians and governments. You don't put pressure on politicians and governments by going through nightclubs. You just go to the politicians and governments like people have been doing. People have been protesting in the streets all the time. Keep doing that, keep ramping up the protests, but not going to a nightclub. Like, I don't, and whatever. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm dumb. You waving the Palestinian flag at Bergheim is not going to change anything. What's boycotting going to do then? What's Boycott and Bergheim going to do? Please, someone tell me. It's not going to win the hearts and minds. It's not going to bring people together. All it does is legit... Isn't that the same thing you can say about this? Doesn't this effectively not bring people together? All it does is legitimise a club that has been censoring our peers for political expression and slow down efforts on... That's false, though. There's tons of people that play at Bergheim who are... Their entire Instagram stories is a non-stop highlight reel of highlighting the struggles and the pain and the misery and the suffering of Palestinian people. Their entire feed. And they still get paid to book at Bergheim. So I don't believe this whole censorship thing. Maybe some people are doing other things and they're being not told to do it. But most people I've seen have been very vocal and very pro-Palestinian are still playing. Are still playing at Bergheim. This is a misnomer. How can one DJ boycott Bergheim help end the genocide? I want to hear this answer. Let's hear this answer. How can one DJ boycotting help end the genocide? 
Bergheim is a, one of the most important institutions in Germany and culture economy. It is synonymous with Berlin's electronic music scene. A coordinated withdrawal of international DJs from Bergheim is a devastating strike to Germans' model of anti-Palestinian cultural censorship. We know that these actions work. After the withdrawal of 70 musicians from CTM Festival earlier in the year, the Berlin Senate immediately dropped its plans for a new anti-BDS clause. What does that have to do with the fucking war? The removal of legitimacy from complicit cultural systems is key and means accelerating the demise of the colonial log logics. As we've seen with other BDS victories, as well as successful admissions boycott of the apartheid in South Africa. We ask, so basically that there is no, they can't, they're just waffling. There is nothing that someone can say here that will let you know that boycotting Bergheim is going to end the genocide. It won't. We are asking DJs to take the stand now. They're hoping it does, but they, don't, they know it won't. Like, this is so weird, man. This is so weird. I'm from a marginalized group. Isn't it more important to get representation? Exactly the same arguments have been made by those who bo broke boycotts to play apartheid in South Africa, in segregated US venues. And indeed, Bergheim, Bergheim needs you more than you need them. Their legitimacy depends on the coast. Oh, here we go. Now we get to the real point. Now we get to the real point. The underlying issues with platforms like Rebels for Palestine is that they feel like there's probably not enough representation. Look at the pages. DJs against apartheid, right? I'm assuming a lot of these pages have un unaddressed resentment against certain clubs because they feel like they don't represent the diaspora of DJs that exist out there. They don't re represent the patina, the fucking breadth of DJs that represented out there, which is really unfair because, you know, it's just one club. One club can't represent the entire world, can't represent the entire scene, you know, and they're doing, I think they're doing a fairly good job so far to get as many people who are unknown and represent all different types of communities and races and backgrounds to play at their place. But they can't, you know, make everybody happy. Cool, that's the case. But I think that's the main thing at heart here because look at this, look at this sentence. Bergheim needs you more than you need them. Their legitimacy depends on the cosign of BIPOC DJs. This is why nights like Reef are so important to them and why CTM festival withdrawals are so damaging. So they have this idea that, you know, that club is not important. The people that are important are the black and brown people that allegedly invented techno because we invent everything, right? Black people invented fucking skiing. We invented snowboarding. We invented fucking printers, iPhones. We invented everything, right? We were Kangs. So obviously because we were Kangs, we deserve everything. <laughs> Even though this club was invented by two white guys and shit. <laughs> oh, fucking hell, man. All right, whatever you say, guys. They want you on their lineup, but do you respect? Do they respect you? Stories about Bergen's racism have long been circulating, from Fear Paris account of having his set stopped for playing D Dilla to Jasmine. <laughs> That's hilarious, though. <laughs> they just think Jay Dilla shit, and they stopped him for playing. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's hilarious. No, that Jay Dilla shit, man. Fuck off. <laughs> to Jasmine in Fintini's experience of racism and transfer bounces. Okay, in tw so two accounts spread across like what? The entirety of the fucking club being around. Fuck off, man. I'm not buying this. The wholesale withdrawal of marginalized DJs could be um, immediate, unignorable pressure of Bergheim. It may even create conditions for generally inclusive programming where representation isn't contingent exploitation. It is already very representative. Honestly, this, this idea that that place is racist, homophobic and stuff is very dumb because when you go there, it's literally the United Colors of Benetton. The lineup is probably, they probably have a way more diverse lineup than Fold does. Fold, one of the best clubs in London, has an all white resident DJ list. Everyone on their resident DJ roster is white. Most of their lineups con contain white people. Fair enough, they might cover the spectrum of queer and LGBTQ flags and shit, but for the most part, they're all white people. At least Bergheim has actual diversity in a range of different people from all over the place. You just, you just look at the tags. Go on the Bergheim fucking location tag on Instagram and look through the people's posts. Everyone from around the world goes to visit that place. So to say that it's racist is really insulting to people's intelligence because you see it with your own eyes when you go there. No, it isn't. It has its issues, like that whole entire city has its issues, right? We know Wild Guan with Berlin. We know its history. So, it's, you know, it's got a lot of work to do. But to say that that place is inherently trying to exploit <laughs> marginalized people is ridiculous, really. And it's also funny, isn't it? 
on one point, BIPOC people are marginalized. And another point, we're the most important people to the scene. Right? Hmm. How is that possible? How are we both the victim? How are we both the victim and the bully? <laughs> How? How is that possible? Um, what if I get blacklisted from Bergheim? Will it ruin my career? Ravers and DJs are people that create and sustain club culture. Clubs are nothing without us. No one, ve no one venue should be seen as an ultimate guarantor of the success and validation. Yet this is how the scene at large now regards Bergheim as a kind of feudal lord to be feared and appeased in return for favours and protection. No one actually sees it. It's just an important place to go. We should have places that are like heralded and held up high in esteem because of the good work that they do. That's not a bad, that's not a bad thing. It doesn't make you look like a fucking loser. It's not a bad thing at all. I think it's fairly normal for you to have like a reverence for a place that's done so much for the scene and has been around for so long. You know, it makes complete sense. I don't see why that's an issue. I don't see why you should besmirch or ridicule somebody for having an ambition to play at one of the most important clubs, you know, in the scene. Is it everything? Of course not. But, you know, things can change also because imagine if the temperature changes around it and you're like sacrificing your career for something that is maybe going to change soon the sentiment around it and then suddenly you're out of a gig now and this thing is still trugging along i don't know i personally think everyone should be fucking apolitical when it comes to music in my personal opinion but i could be i could be i could be really wrong there this isn't healthy artists and musicians deserve dignity autonomy of their labor we should not be accept the arbitrary rewards of self-appointed gatekeepers we should not they're not self-appointed though we appoint them we give them that power because we think the place is fucking amazing. If it wasn't self if it if it wasn't given by the people, it wouldn't still be here many years after. They don't give them. They rarely even do. Hardly anyone from the club even speaks about what they do. It's mostly people like ourselves and people that play there that go there that give it legitimacy. What are you talking about? Many DJs have already turned down Bergen gigs. They are booked and busy. Yeah, they can. Um, if you're not booked and busy, you probably don't have the opportunity to. And why would you, you know, sacrifice your career for? I don't know. Whatever. Um, the community will, will love and support you taking a stand. The strike fund is there for you need it. Any clout from playing Bergheim at this moment is dubious. History isn't kind to artists who cross the picket lines. Whatever. This boycott is historic. An opportunity to build a truly um, uh, liberty. Was that a libra? A libra? Libratory. A liberatory. 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 Well, I've never heard of that word. What does liberatory mean? liberatory meaning why have i never heard of liberatory service to liberty okay liberatory i never heard of the word liberatory i'm not gonna lie liberatory hmm okay liberatory people what you're saying um this boycott is a historic opportunity to build a truly liberatory rave culture based on solidarity and mutual aid trust in your peers respect yourself and do the right thing Last slide. We know that many DJs have been recently turned down for Bergheim without speaking on it publicly. We understand the recent the reticence in going public, but doing so is going to be an incredibly powerful way to strengthen and support the boycott. With the occupying entity poised to invade Rafa, we need everyone to exert maximum pressure now. If you come forward, the community will support you. Okay, cool, I guess. Cool, man. I don't buy it. I think it's a nonsense. I think it's a waste of time. Um, I personally think clubs should be apolitical. I think you're well within your rights as a DJ, as an artist, as a raver to decide where you want to go based on your own political leanings. But I don't think you should expect that on clubs and institutions and platforms like this. You don't, they should be apolitical. They should be neutral. They should serve both sides of the argument, three sides, four sides, whatever. But they shouldn't be in the business of tearing flags down, denying people gigs because they're very vocal no but to expect them to make a stance and then to that stance only the right one for, to be the one that you have is ridiculous to my in my opinion that's a little bit tyrannical in its own way a little bit tyrannical a little bit again i could be wrong but i don't really agree with that but check out Raiders of palestine they're a good page good resource for all this shit to get plugged in on this kind of information for the most part I don't think many people outside of people that are really politically inclined care about this sort of shit, but it is nice to see there are people that do and who are making a stand and who are making it a part of what they're speaking of and demanding more. And hopefully, hopefully it does lead to a ceasefire. I don't think it will. I think the ceasefire will come from pressure on governments and politicians and shit. But if it does happen this way, then you can't blame these guys for taking a stance. But I think there are other ways to go about it. And I think if you're a DJ coming up, you have a responsibility to your own career. You've had a responsibility to how hard it is to fucking make it. 
to take every opportunity possible to get your name out there and to climb up the ranks and then use your platform to spread a message you want to make once you're famous or on your way to becoming famous you know sacrificing or punishing yourself and denying yourself opportunities uh based on you know situations like this is a little bit short-sighted in my opinion but i could be wrong um let's see what you're saying here in the fucking stream chat Big up Don Dota. Saw kind of music play last night in Brooklyn and saw a lot of fans wear Kaifa, um, the Kaifas and other fans proudly wear really fags during the songs, but everyone kept their peace throughout. Thought it was funny. Yeah, exactly. That's how it should be. That's how it should be. Regardless if Israel are the bad guys in this or not, you shouldn't be punishing people because they are patriotic about their country, regardless of how genocidal and ty ty you know tyrannical and crazy their country is in this particular respect. Everybody's political leanings should be respected if they want to raise the israeli flag let them rave it you want to raise the palestinian flag you wave it everyone gets a chance especially in a rave platform it's meant to be a place of peace and unity and shit if anything i don't want to see any flags if i'm honest right everyone's together but represent where you're from cool i get it but let's not let's not do all that shit man let's not do all that shit but what do i know um big up uh what is saying here? Recovery of culture needs an intersectionality discussion. But then again, it's just music. Yeah, it's just music. I don't think we need all that stuff. I think as a person, you can do it. As an artist, you can do it. As a party promotion, you can do it. As a club night, you can do it. As a label, you can do it. But I think as a club, as a radio station, as a magazine, you owe it yourself to be able to be neutral. Neutral. Allow anybody who has whatever message they want to spread to say on your platform. But you yourself should be neutral. Because you want to you want to cover art and art you know covers all fucking ranges of political discussion. You want to welcome all artists to share their work on your platform to highlight all artists. It shouldn't be based on their political because if it gets political, then you you might as well get racial. If it gets racial, you might as well get fucking sexual and all that shit. You don't want to go down that route. That's what I think anyway. But again, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I usually am. I usually 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 am. Continuing on from this continuing on from all this lovely discussion that we're having here i wanted to play this clip because i think this clip is absolutely hilarious in my personal opinion i think this clip is absolutely hilarious so this features the one and only hardwell hardwell played at this festival called saga and unfortunately the cdj stopped working halfway through his set or the beginning of his set allegedly from what i've been able to read the q button was kind of fucked so every time he's trying to press q to cue the next song in it wasn't working something was wrong with it and he tried to get the technicians to help they weren't helping and they got to a point where you're super frustrated and he just kind of freaked out and had a big crash out on stage that's really funny but also very illuminating because it shows you the difference in tolerance levels for professional djs and like amateurs like myself because the things that i've had to, the things i've had to put up playing in places you will not believe the things that i've seen and had to put up with playing in certain places so it's funny to see djs of his level decide you know what the cubine isn't working i'm not fucking playing fuck this shit <laughs> so the caption says hardwell throws headphones and leaves stage angry at saga festival so this is edm so be careful um i'm gonna load the volume a little bit it's edm it's very horrible music but just pay attention to what's going on with this video clip <laughs> <laughs> he throws the headphones, he's pissed, pissed. He stops playing, he's behind the booth now. He's talking to technicians, he's doing something. He's pissed, he comes back on the stage. He grabs a microphone. And now he's, now he's gonna rant. Now he's gonna rant. Now he's gonna rant. Now he's gonna rant. Hey, I'm here. I I love how he wants a pat on the back for doing his job. He wants a pat on the back and a star and a sticker and a hand job 
for traveling for his job, which is a part of his job, right? As a DJ, you travel the world playing music, especially on a professional level. That's your dream for the most part. Cool. I love how he wants a pat on the back and a wank, right? And a handshake and a star and a lollipop for doing his job. Great. Go on, hard work. Continue. Let me be really honest. Let me be really honest. This fucking festival didn't pay me any fucking money to be here tonight. Isn't that pretty crazy? Isn't it crazy? That a DJ of Hardwell's level, again, I'm not the biggest EDM guy, but I know he's a pretty world-famous EDM DJ and producer. Isn't it wild that he has to play for free? Maybe this is a standard thing when it comes to festivals. Maybe festivals do in general, because if you've read anything or you've seen interviews of people that run festivals, they always say that festivals are basically a, um, you know, a thing that you do for the love of the game. They're not usually a good money earner because of the amount of things that have to go into investing into it to make it happen in the first place. So maybe there is something to be said for a business model where you don't pay artists, but you provide a space for punters to come and enjoy. It creates a space for artists to come and promote themselves, but then you just cover their flights and their accommodation. That's pretty insane to think that at hard world's level, you still have to play these gigs to keep promoting yourself and get your name out there. There doesn't come a point where you don't stop playing free gigs, which is interesting because it makes me believe that that statement I said before, where I think DJ Heidi Lorden, big up Heidi, I'm a big fan of her. She was basically asking the question, why do do Glastonbury people get paid? And allegedly from the comments I read, it depends in Glastonbury what type of level of DJ you are. But for the most part, they don't actually pay that well, which makes sense because it's one of the premier festivals. You're, you would be privileged to be invited to play and it will probably do more for you long term than a one-off fee can do, right? You know, it's not going to do much um, fee-wise, but in terms of long term, your fan base, increasing opportunities to get more gigs, that makes it more incredible. But it's pretty wild that Hardwell, at his level, is still playing free gigs. Maybe it kind of makes me think I should be changing the way that I think about getting booked and played in places and offering to play places more for free just for the love of the game and see how that works which is under which understandable why people are skeptical because usually whoever's offering to pay for free nine times out of ten they're not good you know that's the thing <laughs> if somebody hits you up wanting to play for free somewhere they're usually terrible so i guess if you're a promoter you have to kind of be wary that sometimes even if the person's not playing playing for money they might be more harm than good long term Yeah, yeah, big, big up Ezra. Um, festivals are a lost leader. They are just good for promotion. Exactly. Um, exactly, exactly. But yeah, yeah, he didn't get paid allegedly. Don't say. So that's what he said anyway. He, and I believe him. The way he's ranting and screaming, I'm, I believe him. But he didn't mention anything about accommodation or travel. So most likely they do cover your travel or maybe you invoice them and they pay it back. But I'd imagine if a festival's got... Because it makes sense though. You, f you see dance music festivals and they have like a million DJs on there and they're usually all super big and well-known because festivals don't like to book usually underground, unknown talent because it's a festival and you want to guarantee people come and pay for tickets. So you put all the big names on there. So it makes sense that they don't pay because how could they afford it? Uh, even like how it's impossible and this is a festival in fucking saudi arabia or qatar or something maybe they could afford to pay it but regular festivals couldn't afford to pay all the you know the top 20 dj mag djs to play somewhere it won't it won't happen especially when all their fees are like 10 grand and upwards it doesn't make any sense I love how he's ranting and raving about the festival being shit and the tech being shit and they fucked up his, you know, his equipment. That's why he can't play. And they still haven't cut his mic off. They're so incompetent. The people that run this festival, clearly, they don't know how to set up DJ decks properly. They got faulty equipment and they are unable to turn off his mic. <laughs> they don't have to turn off his mic. He's just ranting and raving. <laughs> Brilliant. Listen, I'm here for you guys. Okay, I'm here for you guys. I want you to do something for me, guys. I want girls here over age to suck me off, guys. Right here, guys. All the girls over age, get on stage and suck me off, guys. Everything is letting me down. I can't perform. It's impossible for me to perform. The whole fucking DJ boot is shit. Fucking shit. I'm so sorry. I have to cancel the show. So you 
She dropped the microphone, so he, he leaves. The funny thing is, this is almost standard for me. At my level, playing in bars and pubs, this is standard. I've had decks I've played with where literally one pitch slider doesn't work. I've had decks where I've played with the Q button doesn't work, only to play. So when you're mixing, you have to just press pause and then press play. I've had some ones where you only could use the hot cues. I've had one where the scroller doesn't work. This is just standard, like standard. You just have to figure out on the go and just kind of make it work. One where the mixers, the, the effects don't work and it's just have to mix it. Oh, sorry, the levels don't work. So you have to mix it using the crossfader. So it's, it's impressive to see the, the, the tolerance level professional DJs have. They just don't have any tolerance, which makes sense because at their level, you're playing so many gigs. You, don't, you can't afford to have headaches, interruptions that are going to throw you off your process. It's just going to take up too much time and energy and it doesn't matter, it's a waste because you're doing it for free anyway for promo. You've got another gig tomorrow for 30 grand. It doesn't matter, fuck off. But at my level, I couldn't afford to do this. I wouldn't do it. I couldn't do it. You just have to make it make it happen and make it work. I remember one one time going to play somewhere where they said they had equipment. They didn't have equipment. So I basically had to play off my laptop. Luckily, I brought it with me, but I had to literally plug my laptop into the mixer and just play it off there because the, the CDJs weren't working. <laughs> I had to download Virtual DJ while I was there and kind of like and play with a fucking mouse and key and shit. Can you imagine? Like, <laughs> just figuring it out for fucking $50 and a couple of drink tokens. Madness, bro. But I love that hardware. I was like, you know what? This Q button doesn't work. I'm not going to sit here and wait and figure it out. Like, how I've done in the past where the Q button's not working. So you're on, you frantically have your phone at the side of the DJ booth and you're Googling how to fix this error, going on the fucking Pioneer forums and trying to figure out what buttons to press to reset the thing and da 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 da. It's absolutely mad. But Hardwell was not impressed. He did not want to wait for them to figure it out. He stormed off and decided to go elsewhere. But funnily enough, look at what DJ Hype did. Um, what's his name? Is it James? No, DJ, DJ Hype. James Hype. I forgot his name. I keep mentioning his name. Um, is it James Hype? It is James Hype, right? Yeah, James Hype. James Hype, who I haven't heard of from in a long time, actually played after Hardwell the next day. And he decided to um, do a bit of a remix of Hardwell's infamous rant and breakdown and made it into a very cringy and corny track. But, you know, I'm guessing for the people there, it was quite funny to hear and see, but it's kind of corny and lame, which is kind of like, you know, James, James Hype's um, most operandi, but it's a pretty impressive turnaround in terms of production. So yeah, a bit, uh, you know, a little bit corny, a bit cheesy, but a funny little edit there. Big up James Hype. I haven't heard from him in a while. I don't know what's happened to him. I feel like I saw him all the time during the pandemic, especially. He was everywhere. I think the pandemic might have, might have been a good time for James Hype. He was doing a lot of streams, a lot of production, live streams and shit. And I remember he just stuck out to me because obviously the way he plays, his style, obviously the face that he pulls behind the decks and shit. And the fact that he was one of the only people who I remember seeing as a DJ who'd wear in ear monitors. He wouldn't wear over-the-ear headphones like I do and what regular DJs do. He'd wear those in-ear monitors. I thought it was wild to wear as a DJ um, when you're playing somewhere. But yeah, he'd have in-ear monitors and that's how he would mix instead of having uh, over-the-ear headphones and shit. But yeah, very fast turnaround and a good little remix there of Hardwell's Epic Rant, remix there by James Hype. And of course, this festival, was it called Sage or Saga? They actually put out a statement, um, kind of saying sorry, but kind of not. <laughs> this is saga festival statement on hardwell's breakdown like you gotta love it bro allegedly as well they're known to be a bit of a shitty festival um who don't really do well or write by people and stuff especially the artists but saga statement after hardwell well hardwell we're sorry that rita aura 
sidekick Laureen and other DJs on five other stages got to play on the first day of Saga and you didn't. <laughs> so as you can see, Saga are not very apologetic. They're doubling down almost. The equipment traveled all the way from Netherlands just like you. The same set seems to be working perfectly well for Will Sparks right now. We've worked so hard to build this year's saga for our artists and ravers. We would have solved any technical issues effortlessly and fast if you would have let us know and not stopped your set so soon. We've done all we could to accommodate your request, including agreed payments. We're sorry your fans, our fans, they, they would have loved to finally watch you perform in Bucharest. Nothing but love and we wish you well. Yo, saga, I'm not giving a fuck. So I, I, I kind of feel them. Because there is a possibility that they could have sorted out the issue. Because if it's an issue with the with the with the Q button, it wouldn't been it wouldn't have been too hard for them to have quickly gone in the back, got another deck, and brought it out. They could have easily had him just play, hey, play your longest song possible on one deck. We'll quickly run back and get another one and plug it in. Or there might be a setting that you could do to reset the decks to get the Q button working again. Or just imp or just improvise and just use the play button. It's not ideal. You could use the play button or you could switch and use the Q button as a as a quasi Q. I guess if you're Hardwell at his level, you have to have some like lines in the sand. And maybe one line in the sand, one thing that's non-negotiable is equipment that works when I get there. I don't want to do any edits. I don't want to do any adjustments. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to go in Google. I want to go and plug and play. Maybe that's one of the hard lines in the sand and requirements that are non-negotiable with a professional DJ, which makes sense again because of the amount of gigs they play. They can't afford to just be like fiddling around doing shit like I would have to do because it's the one gig I have in a year. They have millions. He probably had four in the same night. So if it works, I'm playing. If not, I'm out. That might be a thing as well. But I love that Saga's doubling down and saying, you know, everyone else is okay. It's not, a, it's not a, it's a user error, basically. They're doing the Apple thing user error you're not using it right <laughs> r.i.p steve jones but yeah saga festival not giving an absolute doobie about what he has to say not giving an absolute doobie about what he has to say you love to see it you absolutely love to see that level of just you know pure unapologetic boobity boop anyways my friends anyways my friends that's been it that is been the Action Zing Show episode. I think it's is it 759 or something or 797. I don't know what episode it is. I wish I could remember, but either way, it doesn't fucking matter. Big up everybody for tuning in. Appreciate all of you for hanging out with me. If if you're listening via the podcast app, please give me a five star review on your podcast app, Apple, Spotify, all that malarkey. Um, that'd be greatly appreciated. Links to the stories will be in the description. Also, timestamps will be on here later when I re-upload. Um, for those of you watching live, um, we're gonna have a random show. Yep, random show later. I'm gonna go head to the gym now. And when I come back, we'll do a random show. For those of you waiting for a random show, we'll do a super long one because I've got loads of stuff to ch catch up with you guys about. So random show when I get back. So definitely check out that one. When I come back from the gym, I'll do a little random show for check out for that one. Maybe in the next couple of hours and shit. So hang tight for that. Big up Chris Mack. Appreciate you. Um, but for everybody else, thank you for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. Um, today, as my song of the day to commemorate and to celebrate your England going through to the semifinals of the Euros, I'm going to play a legendary UK track from a legendary UK band um, to celebrate England going through to the Euros of 2024. This is Blur Park Life. Blur Park Life as a celebration of England going through to the semifinals. Blur Park Life is my tune of the day. Thank you for tuning in, my people. See you guys again very, very soon. Peace.